and since they have released the 4.x version of that app recently oh, that's yes right. That, that's right okay okay thank you prasenjit are we said there yes uh, manik uh, first of all are you able to hear me yes i can hear you okay I, okay uh, um so i think we are all set here um, so i'll take this opportunity to first of all thank you everyone who have uh, attended who have uh, you know taken the uh, pain to come all the way to you know attend the the muse of meetup um, this time we are doing this on person we try to do this on person uh, you know once a quarter uh, and uh, with covid uh, prior to covid we obviously had a, a, a more robust setup we knew where we are doing this but with covid as you understand you know a lot of things happened but we are trying to you know get back to that uh, you know that in person thing you know and so first of all thank thank you everyone um, uh, for making the time to attend the meetup the second thing, take this opportunity to uh, thank avio consulting for you know coming up uh, you know proactively reaching out to reaching out to me uh, and saying that you know they they want to uh, collaborate with us for this in person meetup so i really want to thank avio for that dan is here uh, i want to also take an opportunity to uh, you know thank raise up and uh, uh, presenting with us in, in the meetup and so uh, and i also want to thank uh, sonali uh, for you know constantly you know making sure that we are able to run these meetups uh, from the chicago chapter uh, manik you have been an awesome pal as always a great news of ambassador thank you and also thank you the community who have turned up for this meetup as well so uh, with that i would uh, transfer this over to dan thank you thank you uh yeah and thank everyone for coming uh appreciate uh, your time um uh, i am dan hines and i'm the account executive here in chicago uh for avio consulting and I'm with uh monic uh, he's our senior architect um uh, and just kind of as a as an overview i will give an overview and then i'll pass it over to uh, monic to talk more about the MDM solution that we put together. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you can go to the next slide. Sure. So um, who is uh, Avio? Um, and what we do is we offer thought leadership and best in class delivery at the intersection of modern software development, and enterprise integration with MuleSoft. So really what that means to me is not only are we proficient in MuleSoft, we've had worked with more than 70 clients um, and had more than 325 engagements. So I think we kind of know all the ins and outs of MuleSoft, but it also goes beyond that, knowing um, the modern software cycle and includes things like DevOps, CICD, um, uh, error handling, uh, testing, security, things like that. I like to say that it's kind of the non-sexy things of, of MuleSoft, but if, you're not, if they're not done right, you're not going to be successful. So that's one of the things that we had. And as, as far as our results are concerned, um, we, have, we are a two-time partner of the year. Um, and also, we were the first MuleSoft consultancy to get Salesforce venture um, funding. So I think that shows just the confidence that MuleSoft and Salesforce has, has in our, our uh, delivery quality, but also our uh, management. Next slide, please. And this is just a, a short snapshot of some of the clients that we work with. It kind of ranges from retail, manufacturing, um, transportation, logistics. But if there's any clients on here that you want more information on or uh, kind of know the, want to know the type of work we're doing, please just come up to me after. And then as far as our, our capabilities, obviously we're uh, very proficient in MuleSoft. Uh, last year we've kind of jumped on the RPA bandwagon. Um, our background was in business process automation back in the day. So uh, we feel that's a real good segue into RPA work that we uh, are ventured out in last year. Um, and really to try to keep, to, to put together that whole hyper automation package. Uh, and then we also do some custom software development, uh, which is front end and back end. That's somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 or 25% of our business. So if there's any opportunities that you're looking for, 
need some apps to be built out or anything on the front end, we'd, we'd, we'd love to chat with you. And then lastly, just from our offering standpoint, we obviously do a lot of project work that can be anything from three, four months, maybe a short project all the way from something that might be somewhere around a year. Maybe you have some resources, but they're not super knowledgeable on, on MuleSoft, so we can come in, train, and help enable your people, but also do the project as well. And then for organizations that really don't have any help at all, we could do a longer-term engagement, um, which we call Enabled Enterprise, which is more than a year, and it's almost like an outsourced um, uh, MuleSoft group that can come in and really do all the work. Uh, we also have uh, Accelerated Success, which is if you just bought the MuleSoft platform, you're really unfamiliar having certifications, we can come in, set it all up, build out three to five APIs, and then uh, kind of get you on the right path um, forward. Um, so that's that's been pretty popular just with people that are coming into the system. And then we also do an architectural assessment. So that's a situation where maybe you've had MuleSoft for a year or two and just not working out quite the way you thought. Um, so we can come in there and look at uh, the infrastructure, best practices, look at some code reviews and see exactly what you're doing. Maybe the, the setup wasn't proper. Um, and hopefully what we can do is, is guide you in the right direction. You can move forward. And then the last three, I like to say that there are uh, three prongs of uh, support. So we have managed services, which is the proactive uh, management of the, the development, test, and production environment. So it's really looking at the entire MuleSoft platform and making sure that everything's operating appropriately. Um, the next one is expert on demand. This has uh, had a lot of demand over the last year. And really what that is, is 40, 60, 80 hours of development time and architecture time that, you know, you can use as a backstop. So if you're doing an uh, API on a flow and you get, you get stuck, you can submit a ticket and we can come in and kind of help you out. So, that's been very popular. And the last one is observability, and that's uh, really looking at the flow through the API. So there's, in many organizations, there's two or three APIs that are very critical. They go down, business stops. So this is an opportunity to really pull data API through open telemetry, and then you can figure out maybe where there's soft spots, where there's bottlenecks, and fix it before it actually breaks down. So is there any questions on Avio or the products and services? Uh, if not, I'll hand it over to Monik and he can go from here. Awesome. Th thank you, Dan. Um, sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Monik Magar. Uh, can, can I ask something? I think, Prasenjit, I'm getting ego uh, from there. Once we start, maybe we can get in there. I think the speaker is, is saying, saying, no. Is the app? No. Oh, it's. Maybe mute in there and. You guys can still hear me? Just show me thumbs up, Dan. I can see you if you can hear me. Okay, that's cool. I see it. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's good. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, so myself, uh, Manik Magar, I'm senior architect with Avio, and what we are going to look here is uh, people MDM implementation. Like when we when we worked with the MDM solution, what challenges we seen, uh, what uh, how we approach that, and how we implemented that for race holding, right? So before we jump into that, has anyone here worked with MDM or knows what MDM is? Um, Maybe people in the chat room can raise hand. I can see them and the people in the chat can write something. Oh, I see some hands in the room. That's good. Um, online folks, if you have seen work with MDM, let me know that just, there's nothing good and bad about it. It's just saying like, okay, do people know what MDM is, right? So let's jump into it and see what MDM is. Uh, people MDM, for example. Why people MDM? In general, MDM is your master data management. We put that into many context. Now, to put MDM in our, our use case context, let's first look at what is the data? Like, what are we dealing with here? Uh, and the first question that we will ask is, okay, 
we get it. Everybody has data, but which data we are talking about? So for that, very first is race holding. Who is race holding? Race is like a leading provider of beverages and food services to global retailers, right? They create a lot of, uh, they create and supply a range of highly recognizable brands and a diverse selection of beverages and food. I just read the slide as it is, but <laughs> what that means is just looking at that, you can imagine if someone is dealing with a global re retailers, the supply chain is running throughout the industry, throughout the globe number of brands, just the number of locations, number of people, all that just multiplies if you are really working at that scale. And all of that means a, a huge ton of data that you are dealing with in your enterprise, in your organization. And data has so many variations. We all know, like data has no limits. You, you will find data in every system of your enterprise. So now, now race holdings having this huge footprint across the globe with wide variety of products, people, locations, even the sub organizations, all that, that just give, gives us an idea of, yeah, this could be a use case to talk about the MDM. MDM is master data management, which is in simple words, you have data spread across your organizations, different systems, different sub-organizations, business units everywhere. So MDM is an effort where you will start consolidating all that data, start creating a central views around it, governing that data and massaging it, making sure the data which was spread across the enterprise now is in one place and it's more reliable and high quality data that you can get to. Right, so that's that's on high level MDM is. So let's let's take a look at how we approach MDM for people MDM specifically, and why I'm saying people MDM is. Like I said, there are so many entities that you will deal with: people, product, uh, brands, your assets, like anything. Everything is a data, and everything can go through MDM. Here specifically, we will talk about people MDM, where we will try to consolidate people data, get everything related to who are employees, contractors, any personnel that works for uh, for race or like a company, get that information into our MDM system, right? And just seeing how global it is, we know it cannot be done in like one step. It's gonna take longer time and we need to take smaller steps, one step at a time and slowly evolve into the final version that we anticipate for the enterprise. So for that part, what we did, we split projects into multiple phases. The first first phase was more, uh, we started like a, early in the January and ran to the May 2022. But that was the first step where we went in, looked at the data sources, what all systems in within Reyes have the employee data, have the contractor data, like people data, all the systems that contained people data. So the first step, first phase was get that data and put it into MDM system. So that was like a first step. Then the second step, we have now data in there. Let's let's now get that data out and start feeding into other systems. So that was our phase two where we picked the data that people MDM data and started feeding to other systems such as ODS, Snowflake, uh, NetIQ, like many systems. We started feeding that data in there. Lastly, it's, it's not the last, like it's not end. It's gonna probably continue because there are so much opportunities that this MDM process opens and you realize at you as you keep walking through this journey, the current phase, I would say, not the last phase, the people MDM phase three, which is where now we are looking at another other MDM systems. Like we have now people MDM there, there is an asset data. So let's talk about the assets there. Let's talk about other enterprise applications, for example, live person, which is kind of like a chatbot applications, which can integrate with your people data to give that real time chat experience to your employees to support them and answer their questions, right? So those are high level the project overview and how we approached this MDM implementation. And it's gonna 
probably continue. Like I said, as you walk in, you realize there is a much more to ex explore, much more to do as you keep walking throughout this journey. So we we saw the use case, but obviously nothing is easy, right? Like it, it cannot be as simple as uh, we walk in, we write and we are done. It cannot be like that. It won't be fun if, if it is like that simple. There are obviously challenges. What are the challenges? Let's look at some of the challenges. And, and I'll say the challenges are not really just for the integration. The challenges are overall, when you start looking at the MDM as a process, you start working towards creating your MDM systems. What are those types of challenges? You have organization, data is spread across everywhere. People are working in different locations, different systems, different enterprises, everything is there. More the number of entities, more the number of data points, kind of means more problems, right? And especially when it is spread everywhere. So what is the first challenge? The first challenge is data model. We have all these entities spread across your enterprise. You do an acquisition and suddenly realize, oh, a similar functionality with your new acquired company is done completely in different way versus how we are doing. So data, mod data models differ. And it's not just one data model. These are like different domains. Within people, you can have HR, you can have different systems for, between employees and contractor, between different part, uh, different vendor related data. All these data models can differ. Now the challenge here is when we start looking at the data model, we realize we cannot define the data model in first setting, like in the phase one or like in the very first step, you cannot define the full data model. So what needs to happen is your data model has to be flexible, which means it should be easy to change. It, it should not be so, so coupled and it should not be so rigid that we do a, some new acquisition or we, we, we acquire a new system or we get a new system and suddenly we realize, oh, we cannot make any changes to our data. That would be bad, right? So the first thing is make sure your data model is flexible. It, it needs to be agile at the same time. Whatever you do, you should be able to move quickly, right? Just because it is flexible doesn't mean you won't be able to move ahead from one point to another. It has to have the both. Right? At the same time, the data model that we choose, you need to consider the business rules. You need to consider the validations across your business, uh, business organization. You need to consider your security in your enterprise. So all these inputs needs to be considered and considered and uh, added into your data model. And that should, that should get you to a good start, good starting point. It's not going to be end because you are going to learn so many things as you learn, proceed on this journey, right? So that's data model. What about the data standards? Like I was saying, the systems are different. Organizations are different. There are so many varieties that you have here across, uh, that you have in your enterprise, right? So for that reason, you need to be able to define the standards and you need to agree with those across your other systems. Like all of them should agree on a certain standard. Yeah, we will try to follow all these standards. Let's start with that. And sooner you do that, it is better so that you have less friction in the beginning. You define your data standards early and you start working on them from there, right? So that takes care of your uh, data standard across all the enterprise. Now you have your model, you have your standard defined. What would be the next? Obviously the data governance, right? Data quality at the end, why are we doing all this? We are doing all this so that we can improve the data quality, right? We can utilize our data in much more sensible way. That is why we are doing all these efforts. So that when we are looking at the data governance, we need to be able to define the processes, the framework, the policies, the business rules that is going to help us 
quality control all the data that we are consolidating from all other systems. So, and it is not going to be a one-time activity. It is going to be a continuous process. You will be looking at your data. You will be conditioning your data. So that data governance is going to be an ongoing process in all this, all this your MDM journey, right? So, so you have defined your model, you have standards, you have defined your governance process. The next thing, which probably most of us are more interested in is data integration now. So we have defined all the in, uh, initial stages. Now it's time to get into action and start thinking about, okay, we have systems, we defined our model, we defined standard. How do we get that data moving? Right? all the source systems that we identify, how do we move that data into the MDM system? That, that should be our next step. And that's very crucial part because data is all over the place in, in our organization. And at some point, at some time, the data can also be outside of your organization. We all know integration is going to be time and labor intensive depending on how many systems you are integrating with? Where are those systems? Are those internal or external? What are the data transformation rules? What are the policies that we need to apply on it? And at the same time, that integration strategy that we define has to be flexible, right? Because we are not going to do this in just one phase, like a one, one implementation. It is going to be a slow evolution from not having MDM or not having that system in place to a much larger vision, larger vision where we have the system, we have data in our control and we can use it for our downstream systems. Like enterprise can benefit from all those things. That's why it has to be flexible enough for us to consider that. So we have integration. Lastly, the probably the final step, it could be data stewardship. We need to define ownership we need to define data stewards who can continuously look at this data, look at this overall process and ensure the direction that we are heading towards is in line with the enterprise goal. It is in line with the vision that as an enterprise, we are looking for, right? Like we should not be collecting any bad data in there. If there is any, any bad data in there, it should be identified soon enough and we should move that out of our system, right? Or improve on that system. So those are on high level, the challenges that you would see when you start working with any MDM system. And these could be used as a steps uh, when you start your MDM journey, look at these as steps and like then go from one step to another and start modeling your whole MDM journey with that. So let's look at on high level, since we are talking about people MDM now, what does it mean to do an MDM for people data? A summarization of what I talked all of that earlier. The diagram, it kind of shows what happens. So on the left-hand side, we have source systems, source one, source two, that can be N number of sources. All of them have our people data, like documents, let's say the first system is your HR system. It is having the data. Second system is also employee system, but has something else, but for the same people. All of that data, we will collect it. We will transform that in our integration. And then finally, we will stage all that data into MDM system. It could be any MDM system, right? The reason for staging is you consolidate from multiple system. Now MDM, which is to its core functionality, core feature set, it needs to massage on all that data. It needs to process all that data. It needs to apply all the business rules that you have defined. It needs to apply the data quality rules that you have defined. So it needs to merge all that multiple system data into one single record, right? Per, per employee, obviously, per person, like a create a golden record, which is a result of merge from all these source systems. And if anything goes wrong, if there are any quality issue, data quality issues that, that, are, that are result of all your uh, business rules, security rules and governance rules that you have defined in the MDM, those needs to go through a review workflow. Hey, uh, Manik. 
Yes. Uh, is it possible to just uh, you know zoom in this uh, flow diagram a little more? I'm uh, ready. Can you sure. see if it's possible? Uh, uh, I think slides more. Let me see if slide mode will let me do it. It's on the slide presentation, so it is just giving me that. Uh, I Hold on. Uh, okay. Give me one second. I'm going to find a source and open it in different one. And then I'll go back to... Uh, Do you have a specific question you want to ask? No, no, I, I just don't. Yeah, I, I know that, you know, it's a little different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, no, that's fine. Yeah. We're, we're going to give it a try and then probably move on. Yeah. Let's see. Give me one second. I think I found what I'm looking for. I'm going to see. Okay. For a moment, I'm going to replace this, my browser screen from presentation to uh, just the image. So, oh, that's a wrong image. I pulled in there. Come on. I'm gonna see if I can. Can you open? Ah, okay. Let, uh, I'll just show it here and see if uh, that helps an answer. So. Is it a little better? I can walk from left to right and show. Asanjit? Yeah, this is much better. Sorry, I was on okay. mute. No, that's okay. I'll just walk through left to right and then I'll switch back to my presentation there. So uh, on the left-hand side is where I was saying we have a source systems which contains the information about our people, right? It could be employees, contractors, and spread across n number of systems the first step is collect all that all that data the, those documents transform them using our integration layer transform them into a data model the canonical data model that we have defined in there right so that data model that document will get staged into mdm system and the reason for staging it needs to, the MDM system needs to process all that data. It needs to massage, apply rules, and all those things. That is what happens in the merge process, which is where MDM is not now going to apply all your business rules. It is going to apply your security rules, all the processes that you have defined in the MDM system. The result of that merge process could be two things. One, you have a data quality issue. Something comes falls out of your rules. That will go into the review workflow, wherein a data steward or someone who is responsible for that data should go into the MDM system, take a look at what happened. Oh, we have an employee problem, let's say it's terminated and the data on it is not matching with whatever business rule you have, right? So then data steward can correct all that data and put it back into the workflow. The final result that we are looking for is create a golden record, a representation for a data, which is a consolidation from all our source system. And this is where now we will have a data which is much higher quality, which is a merge of multiple system. So single view to your employee data or a people data, which you can use for subsequent downstream systems. right? And that would be our, the second next phase where now we have integrations consuming our golden records from here and then feeding those golden records to the downstream systems. It could be anything. It could be your um, learning management system, which is which requires your employee data so that they can create uh, training, training courses for them or people can access your uh, learning management system. It could be your uh, snowflake where you are feeding the employee data for different reports, for different statistics. So there are n number of use cases that you can create once you have that whole data and you are much more real, um, comfortable with that data set, right? Then you can 
find look around your enterprise and see oh this system requires that uh, this data it has been consuming from somewhere else let's move that and put it in golden records right so this is on high level the people mdm process where uh, which to to consolidate from source transform that and then give it to the um, destination systems. And this, this doesn't happen in single go. It's a ongoing process. Every day you will pick the data, you will send into MDM, MDM will massage it, process it, and your outbound systems will start consuming those data. I'm gonna move back to the presentation, but before I do that, are there any questions or anything on this? Okay, I'm gonna move. Hopefully, I can go back to where I was. Okay. Um, okay, so that's the diagram. So let's go back to. So that's that's the overall process. Uh, now, hold on, give me one second. Oops. Uh, give me one second. I'll be Reshare the screen. It just got messed up. Uh, okay. Is it visible? Okay. I assume yes. Okay. So we looked at the people MDM process. Now we know how our MDM process looks like what data we are dealing with and what we need to do. So let's look at how we approached it and how we can solve this thing. First of all, what are our source systems? Because obviously we need to collect the data. So what are the source systems? In this use case for Arrays, when we started working with the people, system, uh, people data, we had at least three systems there. Ultipro, which is an HR software for employee uh, management. So all the employee data is in the Ultipro. Then we have Active Directory, which also maintains people data for network access and so many other stuff, right? So you have AD in there. Then you have a NetIQ, which was, which was managing the contractor data as well as identity and access management for some other stuff in there. So you have like three systems where the people data is spread across for different re uh, reasons, for different type of peoples, for different set of information across these three systems. And then lastly, we had uh, Stevo systems, which is an MDM product or which is a uh, Stevo. It has a suite of products and within that they have a step as an MDM product. And that was our choice of MDM, right? So we have three systems to load data from and push that into Stevo system. So that's those are our systems to begin with when we went in there. So the first step will be data load. We need to move data from these three systems into our uh, Stevo MDM system. There were thousands of people records from all these source systems. And I think there were like more than 50,000 records scattered across all these three systems. And each records with hundreds of attributes because it's a people data, like everything that probably you can require and collect for a person for an enterprise use case would be there, right? So that was, that was one of the thing in there. The, XML data format by MDM, which, which, which fits in for the data model. So when you are creating your data model, you will also consider what is there a system of choice for MDM part? If there isn't system of choice, does that system have a data model predefined, right? Most of these MDM systems may have these uh, data models defined. So that, that can make the job much simpler because you are not real, you, you just have to create a data model of one side, the middle side, the MDM, which is where your data is going, that can help you drive to that data model. Now, once we have that, the challenge would be for integration, the responsibility will be on the integration to consume from those systems and deliver it into the model that MDM understands. In our case, it was like an XML data format. 
And like I was saying, we have now XML identified, uh, XML data structure identified. We have our source system. AD is a pure key value pair. If you look at the MS AD thing, it's a pure key value pair data. Altipro, it's a database you have access to. So it's more of a tables and structured data there. NetIQ, similar to that, right? So you have a variety of um, sources there to work with. That's why your transformation mappings and rules within the data weave should also be considered um, properly when you are moving from one system to another system, your domain isn't changing. You are still working with people. So there has to be an identification for the reuse reusability. The scripts that you are gonna write should be looked from a reusable lens, right? Because it's gonna be same people data that you are mapping with some differences here and there. Lastly, it is very common to have an hierarchical, hierarchical data structures in there. And that hierarchy can come from the organizations, uh, the organization structure, the department structure, the divisions, like different business units that you have. Because when you have like a thousands of people, 50,000 people, they are not gonna be part of one single organization, right? There will be tens of um, uh, business units, like Reyes has five to six, probably more than six, Comp operating groups, which are spread across the globe. Each group then have its own companies and each company then have its own divisions, different divisions, and then divisions goes into department. Finally, all people reside in those departments. So there is this hierarchical data that is spread across this system. So when we are transforming this data, we need to keep that hierarchy in mind. We need to persist that hierarchy in our transformations so we can move that hierarchy into step or MDM system, which is where they need to be able to reproduce all these hierarchy so that it is maintained across the enterprise in there, right? So those are some of the things that we did with the uh, data load part. And when we started loading from that data, the first phase was easy. We have three systems. We have UKG in there, we have AD system in there, and we have NetIQ. It was a more than 50,000 records. It's a get the data from one system, transform it into the XML that we have, and then move that data into MDM system. Now, what interfaces you use uh, for moving this data depends on multiple reasons, like what are the options available for a given system? In this case, for example, what does Tivo support to get this bulk data ingested into their system? What are the protocols that are available for you to send this data? If, if you are really looking for real time and there's not a huge data, Maybe you may go, you may be able to go over the HTTP and start sending it. That might work for Delta use cases. When you are loading all 50,000 records in there, what are the options from both systems? So consider all of those things and then put a layout of how you are going to approach all these systems. In our case, this is how we approached in there. We could, we picked up all those systems. We create the synchronization applications, which are moving data literally every day through all the from these three systems and feeding them into Stevo over SFTP in there. So now we have data load. We we have data in our system. Next is data extraction. What do we do with that? How do we extract data? Hey Manik. Um, before you go to the data extraction, I just got a quick question here. Sure. Uh, is that would you call that? Okay, would you go back to that last slide? Uh, would you call that a mules of process layer or a mules of system layer because it is interacting with the underlying systems? That that is a process layer. I wouldn't call it as a system layer for two reasons, right? Uh, to me, uh, system layers, or in general, when we talk about system layers, system layers should be pure to that system, right? Uh, for example, if if I replace LT Pro by a database in there, and that is a generic way of just extracting data in there, I would write an let's say system API, which is just giving me what is in the LT Pro, not worrying about what you are doing with the data, right? But the moment now we say, oh, oh same, same app, app. 
uh, we need to uh, get, we need to get, get Eco Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. No, I was like loudly hearing myself and it, it sounds weird when I hear myself. <laughs> so, uh, I, um, so the, but the moment when we uh, put the other logic in there, which is the case here, the application is not just reading from a system, it is actually transforming that into a different system. So application is working with two different systems compared to system API, it will only work with one system giving you the data, like a process app, process layer in that case, and process layer then does whatever it has to do. For that reason, I would call this as a process layer, not as a system layer. Understood. Uh, anybody have any other question for yeah, Mike? Just one comment on that one. Typically, in these kind of things where we're moving data from one place to another, we call it a service. We don't necessarily need to name it under any layer as such. We can yeah. simply call yeah. it a service because it's kind of an ATL job, which is taking one data from one side, sending it to other system. Do we really classify under any layer, right? You, yeah, so you, uh, did you get to hear that, Manik? Yeah, I heard Yeah, that. I heard okay. that. Uh, yeah, and, and that, that's a very good point. It's like all these names that we give different layers and um, how do we call that uh, that place is very subjective, right? And yeah, it is true. The This is more kind of like an, if we say ETL use case, does it have to have name? It can be process layer. Why? Because I am reading from two different system. I am processing on that data, giving to other system. But it can also be looked at from the lift and shift ETL process or a service that is running there and moving your data. So yeah, I mean, it's it wouldn't be right or wrong when you either call it process layer or just call it a service or just call it as an ETL app. At the end, these are applications, not really like APIs in there, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So okay. basically, this um, um, the system layer, the process layer is basically more for the conceptualization part, right? At the end of the day, it is. All yeah, these, all all those those layers. Layers. Yes. Yes. Yep. Move on. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so the next one is data extraction. We have our data into MDM. Now it's obviously the goal was to consume all that data, right? Uh, when we start reading that data, the first thing is we need to identify, not identify really, we should have the list of our enterprise applications already. Like, oh, we know that there are enterprise applications which are going to require this data. So it's not that we are just creating the data in the MDM and there is no one to listen to that. There will be tons of applications within your enterprise which require this data, right? The amount of data or the use cases will differ. There will be new systems which, which you are onboarding. For example, if you brought a new system or a new software or you acquired some, some new organization and it brought in the new systems, there could be a full data loads needed for those new systems, like kind of a refresh. We move to a new LMS system and the, now that learning management system requires a full list of our employees as a first time load. So that could be a use case. The others could be an ongoing Delta loads that, that moves daily uh, or frequently between these systems. And those could be for changes. People may change one department to another department. There may be change in their office address. There may be change in their home address. So basically anything that is changing on the employee profiles, those needs to get delivered to other systems, right? So that could be your use case in there. Obviously, just like how on the inbound side, we have data transformation, we will have data transformations on the outbound side, right? The difference will be you have an inbound canonical model coming out of MDM, which is always like consistent to the given entity or given domain. And then depending on which system you are integrating with, those could differ, right? Like what, what data transformation you need in there. As we go through all these things, the last thing, not last, but one of the important thing will be the process uh, reports of your processes or the notifications. All those needs to be part of your data extraction st strategy in there. So when we moved from our data load from three systems to MDM, the very first use case that we had was we needed 
to send employee data to ServiceNow and Snowflake, right? And again, this use case was more of a, like a bulk data load from one place to another. So the next, on the same same approach that we took for the inbound one, we had the similar one for Snowflake, which requires a lot of employee data for all statistical reasons. We push that data from MDM into Snowflake. Now the good part here or the benefit here is Snowflake was producing or can produce all these reports. It, it would have been consuming from existing our source systems. But now the problem is all the source data, uh, original source systems were not consolidated. So the report may not be highly accurate. But now when we are reading from our MDM, we are confident, we know that the data that we are getting out of MDM is a single view from consolidation that we did across our source systems, right? So higher quality of reports that can generate from your snowflakes. Same thing from the service now when it's time to serve our own people, make sure they get what they need. All the data that goes into service now is much higher quality and consolidated across the enterprise, right? So that 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 was our second data, uh, second phase or the second step to see we have the data now, let's look at how we can consume and feed this data to the downstream system, right? So this is all fine. We have data load, we have data extraction. What do we go, where do we go from here? The next step would be enterprise evolution with your MDM system. You created MDM, you are not gonna stop there. You now you have a power of data, you know what data you have. So obviously you will think about your next systems. The very first part of that is your confidence into your data quality. The data that you have available now is much more quality control. So it's easy to rely on that data and feed into other systems. And all this is because the data is merged, it's conditioned. You have, somebody has reviewed it, probably your data stewards, your business has voted on it. So they have higher confidence on what they are seeing out of it, right? The, the data issues have been corrected in the MDM. So you have higher quality data there. With that thing, the next more use cases that comes to mind are like, for Reyes, we have a live person, which is a chatbot, right? So chatbot requires access to the employee data so that they can create requests and all that stuff. So that is use case, asset management system. This huge global presence, obviously they are gonna have a, like a tons of assets, right? So an asset management system is another, another data point that we have. This large organization definitely requires an application tracking system because you are continuously hiring people. You are finding out, finding candidates. All that hiring data is continuously being moved through your HR systems. So that is another use case for all this, your MDM data. And there are many more, like you will keep finding all these use cases. But now we have this data. It also now gives us an opportunity to centralize all these people data, govern this data, share this data across your systems. You don't have to look at all over the place. There's a one place where you know your data is, right? So it's not just the on-demand one. For example, the live person, it's not a, it's not a delta load, it's not a full load. It's actually a real-time data access to your employee data. It's a chatbot when someone connects with a chatbot and starts interacting with the chatbot is literally on real time basis, querying your people MDM system and asking for that person's profile, making decisions based on the profile. So that just opens all those real time system integrations that you can think of in any fast moving enterprise in there, right? So, once we have all of these things, and if we, let's say, uh, put all these systems into perspective, even if we are not, let's say, not implementing all of this now, but if we have to create a vision, how it will look like if we implement most of these things, not all, because there's a lot. How would our 
diagram look like? How would our system integration will look like? So let's take a look at this diagram. It is an addition of all the previous diagrams that we have seen. It still has those synchronizations between the applications, right? Uh, sending data into, into the um, step MDM as well as moving data out of step into Snowflake and service now. But now that we have a real time use cases, we have systems available. Now we can go into that API layer mindset or um, use cases where, okay, I don't need an always lift and shift shift. I need a system API over my people MDM. Why? Because I have use cases where these systems can, can ask for real time data, live person, which is the example of live person. Then, then we have a people MDM system API, which is, which is now only working with your MDM. Then you have your live person X API going and asking for that data. At the same time, the other systems like ATS application tracking system or learning management systems, <clears throat> all these systems can start leveraging the same API and feeding into other systems. So ATS can feed the hiring data from ATS of your choice, which is ICMS here, right? It can feed that data back into, uh, sorry, not back into uh, people MDM, but it extracts that employee data and feed to your ICMS for Cornerstone, which is an LMS system, feed, pull the employee data and feed that into Cornerstone in there. So this here is just a representation of what is now possible. There can be tons of use cases like asset works. It is not even here, but asset works can easily fit into this. Any system that you have seen in your enterprise, which requires employee data can easily fit into this and start benefiting from what we have created over the period of time. It's, it's a phase journey, right? You're not gonna create all these things in like one go. Like let's work on all the apps, go to production and boom, we have whole our enterprise. That's not gonna happen. So you take that phased approach and slowly go towards your <clears throat> overall vision for your enterprise. We created all this. Now, what's the result? Like, what did we get out of all these things? The first thing, we synchronized 50,000 plus person records into MDM. So that just gave us a singular view into our people data. If we need any information about a person profile, we don't need to go and ask multiple systems. We have one single view for that, that person profile, right? It's an enterprise, race is very big and it's continuously growing. A new acquisition happens, new system comes in. We need to onboard people, we need to onboard systems. All this onboarding part became more streamlined because we have a single source of people data. We know where is our data and where to get that data from, right? And when new system comes in and we need to make sure that system is in line with the rest of the uh, enterprise evolution for our data, we have a source of truth. We have a baseline. This is how our data looks like in MDM. This new system should be converted, not should be converted. The data needs to fit into this data and this data model, right? So that just streamlined all of that process. Obviously, all of this thing we did for a data quality. So we have now a improve, we have improved data quality with governance and stewardship in, in very close working with the business because business is an important stakeholder in that they are using this data. IT, as a, as a part of IT and technology, we can make them enable, like we can enable them, but at the end, they are consuming this data. So it has to be very closely worked with the business in there. Lastly, as you start seeing this data, you start identifying security concerns because some of the systems are holding very old data and you see that doesn't make sense. Like. I see this these people, let's say, who are uh, who are terminated six months ago, or who are probably in one department, but somehow they are assigned to both departments. So these are just examples. But as you start seeing and merging this data, you can definitely identify issues with the data. 
right? And which is always good. Like sooner you identify these data issues and fix them, much better it is for an overall enterprise. Data visibility will definitely, has definitely increased since we merged these three systems into one and then started looking as a holistic view for our employee profile. So that definitely have helped and increased uh, for that. Bullets, text, all good. Without numbers, it's like, okay, can you, can you show me some numbers? No, I don't know what you did, right? <laughs> that's That sometimes happens, like show me some numbers. So these are, these are some numbers. Um, what I, what Reyes identified as we processed through the different steps, like for example, this contractor's end date is in the past, but the status was still active. And you can see 2100. That's, that's a very good identification. And that is only, that only happened because you merged all your data Data IQ data, AD data, get your terminations in place, everything consolidated, and you have a view where you can see, oh, this doesn't make sense. It should not be active because it is stamped with an end date. It's not like a good and bad. It just gives you an opportunity to identify gaps in your enterprise. Okay, how did this happen? Let's go back and look at the source, fix the, fix the source, correct the data. Ongoing, there should not be any issues. The primary email addresses across the systems, all three systems managed by different group of people when they are entering, doing the data entry, adding the people. It depends on what email address you choose as primary, right? So all those data sets were identified. The licenses across your software systems, whether some of the people who are terminated and still have access to your licenses, right? That kind of data set, that is important. Employee status not matching across the systems. The race is all over the world and it's a fleet management also when they are delivering stuff, when they are uh, supplying supplying the beverages at uh, larger institutions. So, so the, the, there are so many people on the road. So there is an importance of how many people are working remotely, desk -like, deskless worker, which like, let's say uh, truck drivers, they don't have necessarily desk, right? But they are still workers for it. So all these categories of people, it's easy to look at them and identify the data quality issues. And as, as you keep moving, you will identify more and more and you will fix them. And if at the same time, there was a process defined. So it's not you find a issue, you fix it and done, no. The part of data governance and data stewardship should also include, oh, we found these many data issues with let's say contractor end date in the past, but status active. Why did that happen? Like which system was responsible for doing that? How did that miss? So basically identify the root causes, fix the root cause. So that way ongoing data should not have those data issues. Right. So it's a continuous improvement. And um, at the same time, looking at the root causes and fixing them and improving your overall data sets in there. And in the beginning, I said race is all over the place and they have multiple operating groups. So you can see here, those GLCC, with the Great Lakes Coca-Cola or Martin Bowers, um, RCCB, race, Coca-Cola, uh, no, it's a beverage beverage department. So all these things, all these business units identified issues with their own data points, right? So that num those numbers just shows us how each business unit participated in this thing, plus benefited from all these efforts across our enterprise. So it is not just one business, it is across the enterprise, right? So numbers, shouldn't lie, they don't lie, and seeing numbers always feels good, right? So uh, that's that's the result of what we achieved at the end uh, when we put all these processes in place. And it hasn't finished, like phase three isn't the last one. There is a much more on the horizon since now we know the power of data we have. Now, since the race has seen the data in there, what, what is the quality of data they have? the use cases are still flowing in and there are much more opportunities to utilize and benefit from this data set in there. Uh, with that, 
that's I would say thank you. That's all I think I had. Uh, if there are any questions, comments, we're happy to. We're happy to. So Manik, this is Prashanjit here. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have one question for you, and then I'll open it up for the floor. Um, you know, they they have to ask any questions. First of all, thank you uh, for the presentation. Um, it's really unique uh, topic. We don't get to see uh, MDM integration uh, topic, you know, coming up in the middle me, meet up uh, very often. So I think it was a unique topic. Thank you for sharing this use case and how it was implemented. What was the challenges that you faced? I'm going to ask you a, a, a question, uh, which was, which is like, <clears throat> um, so typically integrations in uh, have this component of ETL component in it, right? That you have to do some kind of an, uh, data loading and things like that. And uh, so what was the experience and uh, how was the, how would you, you know, uh, talk about like, what are the benefits that you uh, got with leveraging the MuleSoft platform? So maybe the unique points that you probably thought about that, are, that you experienced uh, during this uh, transformation. Yes, that's a good question. And that's a very broad question as well, right? Um, it's kind of ETL, but it's not really ETL. I mean, ETL is very generic concept. But when we when we talk about MDM, or the very reason why we are talking about MDM and we are implementing MDM is the scale, the volume of the data that we have, right? Not, not just like in 50,000 or 100,000 data sets. It can span across whole enterprise and that volume that volume of the data creates integrations which require different approaches like some part of that integration would require let's say etl approach some part of that uh, that integration will require a real time data integration approach some some part will just require our api led approach or it it, it will vary based on what what we need from data and that, that is where i say yeah it requires etl now what why we when we use mulesoft how does it change or what are the good things um when we what, when we implemented it with mulesoft right so when we pull this data from one systems the 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 patterns that we implemented in our etl application like not ETL, the process applications, those same patterns, we were able to put them into the real-time applications as well. So reusability was very good across it because at the end on the inbound or out, input or output, we are dealing with the same data model in there, which is governed by data, uh, by the MDM in there. So we were able to use capabilities like reusability for our data view modules or reusability for our flows that we are we are implementing on both sides plus the transformation transformation between all these three system, three systems and n number of system that is on the other side the those transformations when created with data we, we were able to it's easy to create those transformations with a large data set and feed them into the system that is needed so what i would say is there is a lot of uh, overlap between various layers, even though we may call them as ETL, process layer, API layer, real time different, but the uniqueness of the platform and consistency within the platform just makes it much more efficient to reuse things across it and speed up the integration as we keep progressing on it. Like as more and more we do, the faster we get to implementing stuff and opening a new integrations in there. So I definitely see that flexibility of the platform um, is, is a value in there. Thanks, Manik. Um, yeah, I'll open it up to the floor for any any other questions. Any, any So there are a couple of things I would also want to mention that, uh, you know, uh, so we have some new sort of swags here for people who are able to make it to the in-person. Please feel free to grab the swags. Uh, these are for you, mm -hmm. and uh, and also I know that we we were running a little late, so we couldn't do an introduction. But you know, feel free to you know introduce yourself once we are done, and you know, and uh, yeah.
and there are also some good amount of food and beverages left so if you want to serve your help yourself please do that uh with that yeah any 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 questions would you yeah, yeah. so uh you me from yeah, you can you can come here and speak, or you can yeah, just try sorry. speaking. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, oh, you know, very much. Uh, so I'm uh, an architect at Salesforce Professional Services. So, uh, so one question I run into often work with customers in healthcare. Uh, they have this problem of like, you know, splits and merges with persons. So what they thought were two people turns out to be one, or what they originally thought was one person to be two. And by that time, there's a fair amount of data that is collected in systems like Salesforce, you know, addresses, phone numbers, cases, and other things. Have you come up with you know, or do you have any ideas there in terms of how you've handled those in the customers or problems that you work with? Uh, yes, and that, that is a pretty common problem when we start working with the people data, right? And especially when it is spread across these systems and every system is maintained by different set of people. So when we talk about, for example, when we talk about employees data in, in the uh, UltiPro and versus contractor data in NetIQ, that is still a people data, but employee have an employee number and probably contractor may not have a contract employee number, he may have a contractor number. Same set of data. Now put that into AD, which is having both set of data, but somebody forget to put in contractor number on that one and a different attribute got added. So there were issues like that. Uh, the approach, one of the approach for that is because all of these things should get visible into your MDM system. Three different profile, th three profiles for the same person coming into MDM. And now when we define our systems, there needs to be an attributes of identifier that we should define. Like if the data is coming from the uh, UKG system, these are the primary attributes versus in other system, these are the ones. They should match, that's the business rule. Like they should have the values that business trust on. But when they don't, that is when where we have seen it going into the review workflow saying, okay, I have this contractor, but it doesn't have this data because it is not matching with our AD system. AD is telling me he should have this one. So all these data mismatch, in my opinion and my experience, I have seen them going into review workflow. If there is anything that can be resolved by applying a business rule, automated rule, those were applied, but most of those conflicts is what were triggered in the review workflow and people going and taking a look at those review workflow and then saying, okay, I accept. It's, it's more like a git merge. You see a conflict, you either merge them together or you decide which, which one is true and which one is not and you accept one and let go the other other and that that's the that's the part of improving the data quality during the merge and review process so yeah we have seen those issues and uh, those have happened and we have corrected it uh, uh, Dan, do, uh, do, do you know if um, if Brian is there or if you are uh, if you want to add anything in there from Rhea's perspective any experience anything how that process was followed. I don't. I don't mean to put Brian if you are there to put you on spot. But if you feel like adding any input, please feel free and welcome there to add any thoughts. Yeah. Th thanks, Mike. Um, so um, first off, I'm I'm Brian Lee. I'm uh, the director of the data management for uh, Ray Uh And and Mike was right. I, I think we you know that scenario that you brought up um, happens. Quite often, and and one of the things that you know we do is that's why we, one of the main reasons why we brought in an MDM tool, um, and so it's more of an MDM solution and less of a, a MuleSoft integration type of solution that happens. But uh, we have we have a team of of data stewards that are constantly looking at data, um, and so when it when it goes through MuleSoft, it goes it lands into our MDM environment. Uh, that's where we can see if, if you know we just have to it's almost case by case um, we do have some algorithms within the tool that that does some matching automatically um, so you know if, for example if, if the the employee ID numbers are the same well that's a pretty good indication that, that these two records are really 
same person. Um, but if you get two uh, employee records that or ID numbers that are different, um, but other things match, you know, their their home address matches, their the first name and their last name, their cell phone matches, you know, because this person could have been a rehire that that comes in, which happens quite often in our industry. Um, and so then we go through and we can look to, to have that merged. Um, once it's merged, and this gets into the, some of the work that Mike was talking about in the, in the phase three, is at that point, that's when we can start to push that information to downstream applications um, to merge that record um, so that it's a complete record across the system. Um, we're not 100% there yet, but, but we're, we're inching our way close to try to automate this so we don't have to go into each application and correct that, that data. Um, that, should I answer? Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Hey, Prasenjit, I have one, one more question. Uh, yeah. Sorry. So, so uh, the UMD for this use case generally the why my curiosity is why you choose MuleSoft as an integration. I know the I mean for this MDM scenario the integration is the very toughest part. And uh, so why the MuleSoft platform uh, you chose? Because from the MuleSoft like for this kind of heavy like I I don't know exactly what what's the volume of data, but uh, if there is a high volume of data, the MuleSoft APIs will use more V cores. And that is, that is really, I mean, uh, for this, uh, it will definitely use more V cores to, so to convince the client for more V cores and number of more, like as the number of V cores increase the, uh, like it also, add more bill to the client side so what <laughs> so that's uh, my question is as uh, i work uh, like most of the clients i have worked mostly on the client side so that's the general uh, so that's my question how so uh, why you chose the musoft uh, as an integration platform for this mdm use case and uh, how how it's much more uh, provides the advantages for this kind of thing. Kind of... Mike, do you want me to answer part of that question? Uh, yeah, yes, I was going to break it into two parts and I was going to request you to oh. talk about the first part about the like MuleSoft decision. I can take care of like V course and any technical, but yeah, please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. First, uh, so uh, great question. Um, so uh, first off, uh, we made the decision to, to standardize um, MuleSoft within the organization. Uh, about four years ago. Um, it didn't start with our, our people data, it actually started with our, our customer data. Um, and, and one of the primary reasons uh, was security. Like a lot, of, a lot of organizations, we needed an environment that, uh, an ETL tool, uh, you know, a way of moving data that we felt was secure. Um, and so we did evaluation on a lot of different products, um, you know, uh, and we ended up with MuleSoft, mainly for the security aspect of it. Um, and then once we started uh, going down this journey and we started going down, you know, with our, with our customer data, building out the MuleSoft integrations, um, we, we quickly realized uh, the, the cost aspect of that because, uh, you know, especially uh, we use um, MuleSoft to, to send data to, to Salesforce from our Snowflake. So our Snowflake environment was acting like, a, you know, like an enterprise uh, transactional system. Um, and so we had a we we got double build there. We got a double build on the Snowflake side, and then on the MuleSoft side. Um, and so we had to figure out how to make this more cost cost effective. Um, and in well, that, my we really need some help here uh, to reduce that cost. And, and my I'll turn that over to you because I, I'll let you get into the technical aspect of it. Um, yeah. Uh, but we were able to reduce the cost quite significantly by reusing APIs. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, no, thank you, Brian. Yeah, and that, that's that's a right segue into the cost effectiveness, right? Because I think it's not about the cost. It's about the value that is being added. 
you everything is going to cost you whichever direction you go everything is going to cost the question is what value that that a tool is adding into this we we will consume more v cores because we have a higher data volume processing maybe fine may not be fine but the question is at the end of that processing after consuming those many v cores what is the output of that process what value it is adding into my enterprise if it is resulting into a very high quality data which i am feeding into 10 downstream systems creating more opportunities and benefits for me then i think that balances helps us to balance the cost of running all these applications the cost of consumption and processing all this data right so uh, i would uh, all of us will have probably different opinions and approaches towards how do we look at stuff but in my opinion it's always okay i am going to choose mule soft or i am going to choose something else but at the end i am going to pay for something what value i am going to get out of it if i am satisfied with the value that i am getting back the cost is always going to be there right so we core consumption and like brian was saying once we started on this journey once we created more apis and the reuse started um, coming up with this reuse in in place the really that cost versus value started getting much more balanced because now you have apis on top of the systems just that people mdm system api that i showed right now we have data we have system api any new any new system that is coming into our infrastructure and requires this data it is very easy to grab into that system api and grab the data and process it and at the same time the security part that brian was referring all this is all secured by different approaches jwt or or even the um, uh, client credentials in there so there are ways to secure all of these things right i hope that like between me and brian we answered your question sonali <laughs> yeah absolutely uh, yeah well, thanks for answering my question because mm -hmm. this is the at a, at a very initial level these kind of challenges comes when you design this uh, mdm approach and uh, when you choose a mule soft as an integration platform yes and i think the challenge in the beginning if this is your very first like a use case and you are looking at from the cost perspective it may be difficult to justify that cost during the phase 1 data load because at that time we haven't seen the output like the other phase 2 phase 3 where the data is really now generating value right that yes. is still in the road map so unless that is seen it's challenging to talk about the value versus cost unless you really see the materialized value in there yeah absolutely Thank you so much, Manik. Thanks, Brian, for the answer. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Hey, Manik, I have a small question here. Yeah, sure, go ahead. So, what precautions you are taking so to avoid the performance issues while processing the huge data? Uh, performance issues and performance tweaks is a never-ending. process right like you can't optimize everything in the day one plus you can't optim optimize everything to 100% you have to find that sweet spot where performance versus the consumption is justified so what what we do is in in terms of mostly this uh, large processes the huge data loads that we are running right what is acceptable range is this like a real time system we are loading 50000 records how time sensitive is that we can put like a 1 gb um, 1 week or there and make sure it runs fast finishes in like a very split second and all that but is it needed is someone waiting on the other side to get that data in like a next second right so we look for all those things how really critical it is and what is the acceptable performance from business perspective how critical or non critical the process is once we understand the requirement like how much we need to spend effort on making sure it runs like a bullet train even though it's not needed then it doesn't make sense right so what we do is we continuously run those evaluation and then we run the application from smaller v cores to higher v cores to understand what is the optimal that is good for the business right and if if that works to to link it back to previous sonali's question 
you can throw in like a two week course there and have a full resource working. But again, to justify that cost versus the need, is it needed? Probably not needed. We are okay with the 0.2 v course because it's a one time process runs in the night. It's okay for it to take 10 minutes. It's not needed to put two vehicles in there. So we took all those in 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 uh, all those points into consideration, and then start running iterations from smaller number of data to higher number of data sets, smaller resources to higher resources to find out where it is going to break and how much we can tolerate and accept uh, from performance perspective. Because really, for performance, what seems performant to you may not seem performant to me. So it's very subjective, like what, what is considered as a very performing thing. Is that, I hope that answers question about yes, the approach. I agree with you. Yeah. Hmm? Thank you. Oh, welcome. Are there any more questions, comments? Yeah, Manik, in this integration, are you using any specific connectors uh, or, or any out-of-box feature or it's just standard SFTP file-based processing? No, there are connectors. Sorry, yeah. Uh, there are connectors that we are using. Prasenjit, uh, can I request to just go unmute? Sorry. <laughs> it, it's like... it. Every after my two words, I hear my own words, so it just feels weird. Uh, but yeah, we did use, and the reason for that, for example, um, Microsoft AD, right? So there, AD was exposing everything on the LDAP protocol. So we needed an LDAP connector to query the um, query the, the uh, uh, Microsoft Active Directory and get that data and read that data from AD, put it into the system. So. We definitely use LDAP connector. We did use L SFTP connector, obviously, because we are delivering in there, right? For uh, for the ulti process team, we had access to the MS SQL Server database. So there was a database connector um, required in there. So there were connectors, standard connectors that we leverage as applicable in there for APIs, obviously HTTP, so LDAP, SFTP, all those connectors were used. So it wasn't like just uh, you can't even do that. Right? Snowflake, did you use the Snowflake connector? Ah, uh, yes, Snowflake connector was also used in there. Like Snowflake used. Plus, we 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 are going to integrate, let's say, with O365. So there will be an integration with Microsoft GraphQL API. So Snowflake inter, uh, Snowflake one service now. So there are connectors which are used. Some places we even went with just API. Some places we went with the connector. So it all depends on what we need what connector supports and what is not supported. I think when we integrated with LDAP connector, there were issues with the uh, SSL support for that connector. So we even had to work around that connector, get that thing working, and then go back and forth with Mule uh, to make sure the subsequent release of the connector fixes that bug. And then, then we again use the new one. So a lot of things happened around that connector as well. Yeah. So it's specific to the MDM that you are using, you're using STB M MDM, right? Is there a plan to for a connector release for this particular product, or is is there some some roadmap? Because for connect this particular core application is MDM, right? So are we trying to bring in that value from a mule software perspective that we will have something? Stebo, Stebo is. Uh company which owns this MDM, right? And within that, they have different products. So Step MDM is the product that we integrated with. I don't think we have like a personally or a, like an, as a part of this efforts, we are not building any connector for Step. Uh, different reasons for it. For example, for inbound, when you are going over SFTP, it's a bulk data that you are pushing in, like 50,000 or 100,000 records you are putting into a, a CSV file, let's say, and you are putting that CSV file for steps consumption. Step has its own algorithms, its own mechanisms of consuming that data. So it's going to read that file to whatever processing it has to do. So it's a complete process on the step side. right? The other side, when you start consuming, Step also has a REST APIs. 
So now, at least for the current use cases and current things we that we need, the simple access over the REST API for step is good enough. We don't need connector for integrating with the API, like REST, REST API. So at least at this point, I haven't seen a need to create a connector or anything for step for those two reasons. One way, full bulk load out uh, on the other side, step has a good REST API that can be consumed. Yeah, thanks, Manny. Yeah, welcome. Okay. Uh, hey, Manny. Uh, I just wanted to, yeah. I'm, I'm a bit curious that how you have uh, deal with a, a data loss while data load. Is there, I mean, is there, is there a many mechanism that you have developed uh, through MuleSoft or is there any separate mechanism, as Brian said, that some, some algorithm would deal with this data loss? So two, part, two parts to that, right? Like one part is the data load that is happening from the mule, which is where the data goes into staging, a staging area of MDM system. Now, once we put that into staging part of the MDM, it is really out of mule context. It is now within the context and the boundaries of MDM system. MDM does that processing and as a step product, it may have its own meaning and uh, patterns of processing it there. But from integration perspective, when we read the data from all these source systems, we are transforming that and putting into CSV. Let's say for some reason, the process stops, it breaks and um, it errors out, the file was corrupted. What are the, what are the, what are the approaches that we can take? Right? So depending on what is your data and what is the item potency of data? How much tolerance tolerance your system can handle? It will depend on that. In our case, if process stops, we will just rerun the same process because it is the same set of employee data, and it is it you can send the same data to Step because Step had the capability to make sure it can reprocess same employee data again and again without causing the duplicates in there. So that's why I would say that part is subjective, depends on where, how much your system can handle. In this particular case, since the data was, I wouldn't say 100% static, but at the time of processing, it was static. Even if it fails, we can pull that data and send it again. It's not like that. If we reprocess the same employee, step will create a duplicate record for that. No. To, to the other points that Brian was referring to, having employee ID and different primary attributes, those were still same. So we were able to send that data back in there and reprocess them. I hope that answers the question. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is, there, is there any questions we have? Uh, any other questions from the data, uh, from the online audience? Uh, well, in that case, uh, um, thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Please feel free to grab your swag. Uh, yeah, that's all for you. Thank you, Avio Consulting, for coming up and you know helping uh, you know set up this in-person meetup. Um, we really look forward to you know more such meetups in the future. And thank you, Manik, for you know such an interesting use case. Uh, I think the uh, thank you, audience, for you know interacting and you know asking the questions. I think I felt they were fully engaged. Um, and yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Sonali. Thank you, Manik. Thank yeah. you, Avio Consulting, and thank you so much, Ben. Uh, thanks for sponsoring this meetup, and this the meetup is wonderful because of you guys. So thank yeah. you so much. Thank you, Prasenjit, for uh, helping me out in this meetup. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, uh, thank you, Brian, thank for you, Brian. Brian, for all those additional details that we have. Why we you know, why we took this approach? How we get the mules off in there? That definitely adds into the context in overall this journey. So thank you for adding those things in there. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Online All right. So it's it, it's like people in the room are saying like, okay, guys, you need to go online. Guys, we need to go and have our food and things. So <laughs> just kidding. Have a good good rest. Have a good, good rest. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Manish. Thanks. Thank you, Ivan.